I thought so. All right, without further ado, I am introducing you to writer-director Tom Gorman. Hi, everybody. And writer Ken Hedden. Hello. Hello. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming out. Glad you guys all enjoyed it. All right, let's get into it. Let's start at the very beginning with the, uh, like, figuring out the idea for this whole thing, because I'm wondering what came first, the idea to, you know, make a movie where an actor could play themselves or the idea that, that you wanted to work with Nick Cage? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think as someone that writes things, uh, I think you always want to work with Nicolas Cage because you're curious about, I mean, you're just curious about how he would read a line, you know? Like, I mean, you just saw the movie when he comes in and says, you know, you've got me on a wild goose chase. And you're like, oh, that's, wow. I didn't see that coming. Or like when he does a four minute long fucking and you're going, just looking at each other, you know, because I didn't know that was going to happen. That's not a direction. That's not something you make up. You know, that's not something you say, hey, Nick, do you mind saying fucking for, for, for 25 minutes? I was going to ask what that looked like on the page. <laughs> Literally fucking. And he was just like, I got this. Give me one second. And he does it. And Kevin and I are kind of looking at each other. And you take the headphones off. And he wandered over to us with a smile on his face and said, I wanted it to be transcendent. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, it's like, you don't want me to do anything else, do I? Do you? And like, no, that's perfect. Just, just move on, I suppose. Can you do other impressions, or is this just because you work with Nick or something? Uh, clearly, <laughs> yes, he has impressions of a lot of people. I'm going to have to put you on the spot. Ask another one, please. No, I can't. I, I can all, all, right now, I'm pretty locked in to Nick. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I'm dreading the moment when I do it in front of Nick, because he's kind of a big guy. I'm afraid he's going to kill me. Uh, but, you know. but no, we had the idea that we wanted to do a movie about... Um, I, I think the initial idea was, was we were thinking that Nick would sort of pop back into the zeitgeist because, you know, he's too talented to stay out of it, I suppose, and the memification of, of Nick on the internet, and then we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if like, you had an, uh, you, you know, an actor who had to become the hero that he was in the late 90s and 2000s, which is kind of when we started you know, getting interested in his movies, and to save his family in real life. And from there, we just built the narrative around that. So you write this on spec. There's no backup plan if Nick doesn't want to do the movie. That puts a whole lot of pressure on your pitch. There was so one was backup your... plan. Which was, was at some point, it was one of our friends' ideas that he was like, you know, if you can't get Nick, you should. Kevin Turner. Kevin Turner. Oh, yeah. it was to get like a great actor like Christian Bale or Daniel Day Lewis to be in Nick Cage prosthetics and play Nick Cage. <laughs> <laughs> that was the backup plan, which is a terrible backup plan because <laughs> when Daniel Day Lewis is not doing that. But we did <laughs> think about, like, yeah, what if Daniel. I don't think your mic is on, by the way. I, if Daniel Day Lewis. Is your mic on? Is it only my mic on? That's all. Do you have a red light on yours? No, I do. Switch it then. Okay. We thought maybe a sequel would be Daniel Day Lewis, like, buying a castle somewhere in Europe and preparing to play Nicolas Cage, but. <laughs> just be, I don't know, maybe. That's not actually the sequel, but it would be a good one. Um, I already pitched. Uh, is this on? It's kind of on. You can hear me. I already pitched you what I think the sequel should be. Yeah, you did. Do you remember what it was? Um, I still think it's a genius idea. Tell them. So I think we need a massive talent anthology where we have another actor step in and play themselves, and it has to be Jamie Lee Curtis fighting her way through a horror comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and David Gordon Green. Yeah, he comes second. back. Yeah, he is the on. connective tissue through this anthology series. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you guys knew or know David Gordon Green, the director of the Hollywood fran or, um, of the Halloween franchise, is the director that Nick is auditioning for uh, at the beginning of the film. You know, Pineapple Express. Oh, they did Joe together. Uh, they did Joe together. Yeah. Great movie. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, can you tell us a little bit about your pitch to Nick now? How do you uh, how do you even start by explaining the idea for this movie to him? Well, we you know we had written we didn't want to explain the idea to him because he would probably just go no and then leave and so we just we we wrote the entire script and so we had the entire thing and we thought you know. He'll just read it, and you know. But at that point, Kevin and I were discussing, and we said we need to get a money offer. 
behind this thing or else there's no way he's going to take it seriously. So we decided to shop the script around to, to find Daniel Day-Lewis and Christian Bale had passed by this point. Had <laughs> passed at this point, yeah. So we shopped it around. And I think the, the whole thing was a roller coaster because we got a call from a studio that said, we would like to make this movie and we'll give you X amount of money, which was an enormous amount for what we thought we'd get. And we were gonna pay Nick, at, you know, I forget what it was, something like $3 million. And we were like, this is incredible. We got another call, like on the way home, that was like from his manager that said, there's no way in hell Nicholas Cage is ever doing this movie. And we were like, oh shit. This is just kidding. So it was a whole roller coaster, and it, you know, after that, we sent him a, a long letter um, detailing our intentions, I suppose, uh, and maybe why he should do the film. Also, just remembering, this was on the blacklist, wasn't it? Did that help you at all in the earlier stages? No, for, for anyone who doesn't know what the blacklist <laughs> is, it's a, a, a list of uh, some of the greatest unproduced screenplays out there. I think that helps get it sort of into the studio system so that it became this kind of a couple studios got interested in it and then Nick understood that oh, okay this is uh, this is not just some stupid sketch kind of movie where he plays himself and it was like a a, a real thing so it, yeah I think it gave it some some legitimacy in that way yeah so visibility but part of the being on the blacklist is this is an unproduced screenplay <laughs> people are you know they would often say to us like there's a reason why this is unproduced <laughs> because you're never going to be able to make this he's never going to do it but I mean there's a whole litany of things that uh, I, I don't know why people are so discouraging about the movies that you're trying to make but they are and so we just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing from every different angle to, 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 to get him to eventually say yes so you have all the challenges on, on that side of things, but I'm also wondering, like, did either of you know Nick at all? Because it's like the greatest thing in the world to work with an industry icon like him, but did you know he would be like a cool guy, a good collaborator, or were you just all in no matter what it wound well, up being? I mean, honestly, I think, you know, we, we took whatever it was, eight, nine months, we wrote the script, we just would spend days talking about what we thought Nicolas Cage was like at home. We were just <laughs> reading interviews with him, trying to truly insane. Yeah, That's trying right. to get inside his head. We didn't know Nicolas Cage. We never met him. We never. We had no connection to him. It was like two literal crazy people ruining their careers. But I think honestly, and I, I've said this, and I said this to Tom at some point. I'm like, okay, you know what? As long as we get to have dinner or lunch with Nicolas Cage, at some point, this will have been worth it. So that really was sort of the, the end goal for me, it was just like, I just want to sit with this guy and just have a salad. Yeah, have a salad and know what he's like. That was never my end goal for the yeah. I didn't have like a Thank very God. low yeah. bar for this no, one. Well, I'm glad you uh, you surpassed that particular bar. <laughs> yeah, we, got, we did end up having a salad with him, which oh, was Oh, that's good. Oh, you, you took know, all the boxes. Weird. That's great, though. Uh, we did, we did, what yeah. kind of salad does Nick Cage order? I think, well, we, we ended up meeting him at the Pacific Dining Car, rest in peace, downtown, remember that? And uh, we got there, and he came over, and the first thing he said was, this is where... Humphrey Bogart used to come and uh, when he didn't get a role and drink martinis and we were like, first of all, what role did Humphrey Bogart not get at that time? There was like four anchors, you know, like, like, made movies. So like, he's just interested in Hollywood lore and I was like, oh, I think I'll have a martini with lunch then and he's, he remember this and he goes, well, I'm on a dry January. <laughs> Maybe just one. <laughs> this is the weirdest shit. It's so strange, but, you know, I mean, it's Nick. It's, you know, they say in the movie with that little lunch scene, it's, you know, what do you expect, right? I also think we're realizing that you wouldn't e you wouldn't have even needed Christian Bale. Like, you could... Truly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not... <laughs> Uh, you you have his, his mannerism is, and his intonation down pat, though. So there's there's obviously a lot of fictional elements in this movie. It's not actually Nick Cage playing Nick Cage true right. to life, but there's a lot of very specific mannerisms and things that are very true to him. So once he committed and read the script, what would you say is the biggest difference and what type of things that he added that weren't in the original one? Well, the, the greatest one he added was... You know, there's the scene with Nick and, and Nikki, young Nick, 
and in the script we had written that Nick, uh, sorry, that young Nick would pick Nick up and give him a peck on the cheek at the end of that scene, and Nick came to us that morning, and well, I'll let Tom do the, the impression of what he said to us. He always comes in with ideas because he hammers like four Red Bulls and then gets the set, and he's like, oh, I'm so excited about acting, like a thousand movies in, you know, and he's like, and he's just like, I, I, I need to talk to you guys. And so we're, we walk over and we're like, okay, this, I mean, it's always a fun moment. And he just said, well, I think, um, I think Nicky should pick up Nick and deeply French kiss him. <laughs> and we're like, that's, well, yes, obviously. You, should do, you don't stop Nick from French kissing Nick. And then, so we said, you know, by the way, it's peak pre-vaccine COVID when we're shooting. And I'm like... There's like a poor stand-in who's gonna get a friend, you know, like a like a double and I'm shooting over his shoulder and I'm like Nick's gotta kiss it. The whole thing I was like scrambling around. And then Kevin gives him a note. So he's doing it and he gives him a note to put his hand up on the back of the head and like really go for it. And Nick goes, No, no, okay, now this feels exploitative. I'm not and he, and he does it. And he does it crying laughing and he's like and, and he's like okay let me get and run it back and he comes over to the monitor he wants to see it and he's watching it and he's pissed off at this point and he watches it and then and he looks at him and goes oh that's pretty good actually <laughs> and he got, got really got, I don't know almost unnaturally into seeing <laughs> Himself kiss himself. <laughs> he did. I mean, sorry, and he did. He did add the line that uh, you tell Nick Cage, which is good, which is fucking <laughs> genius. And I will happily take credit. We can happily take credit for it. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. That sure was that. him going. I think you should say Nick Cage smooch is good. Here. <laughs> he would have lit. He also some weird detail. He would elliptical every morning from 3 to 4.30 in the morning. He would do the ellipt First of all, think I don't know what he wears on the elliptical, but I imagine I'd picture him in, like, leather, you know, or whatever. And during he would read the script again every morning uh, while on the elliptical and then have thoughts, and he would text me his thoughts. So I'd wake up to, like, 30 <laughs> Nicholas Cage's whatever thoughts came to him while on the elliptical, and that was... That was one of them. I don't know if this, the kiss scene is like the maximum with this, but is there anything he pitched to you and it made you say like, we could never do this, it's never gonna get approved, it's never gonna get, it's never gonna work, but then it wound up making it into the final cut of the film? Well, weirdly, because it would be one of the first shows up in the pandemic, um, I think they kind of forgot about us, and we were just out there, and they, they were just dealing with everything at home, and we were just shooting a movie, so it was this very strange studio experience where we were just like, I don't know, that sounds good, and then we did it, and it, in the end, it kind of worked. Um, there's only one bit of the movie, and Nick has talked about this a lot, that, that we thought would be in there that got cut out, which was um, an action sequence between Nick and, and Nikki in the style of the cabinet of Dr. Calgary, and uh, it takes place inside Nicolas Cage's head. It's in black and white, and it goes through uh, face-off Con Air, <clears throat> gone in 60 seconds and leaving Las Vegas. And um, I think Lionsgate, for having a, a, a lot of like true balls to pull the trigger on this movie, were like, all right, guys, like, we they had to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> with, yeah. Yeah, they were like, just come on. We, they, they, we have they, to show this in the rest of the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, uh, you know, they, they, they made us. There were some other fun scenes that we cut. We cut a scene, and we had to cut it. This one we had to, it was more like just didn't quite work, but it was a fun one where um, at, when they <clears throat> take acid, they go into a church, and Nick looks up, and he sees Jesus, and Jesus speaks to him, and, and his kind of Jesus' bit is that he goes, you know, I am... I'm so sorry to be this guy, Nick, but I just, I am a massive fan, and I absolutely love you, and, uh, <laughs> bad lieutenant, bad lieutenant, <laughs> world. Bad and Nick is just <laughs> like, yeah. Nick, he's like, oh, well, thank you, Lord, uh, I was really happy with how it came out, it was like, we, I don't know, there are things like that that just ended up being, um, I don't know. <laughs> I've heard about that action scene that you had to cut, just because I'm curious now, where would it have fit in the story? 
Uh, it's where uh, at the end where he's he hits him and I'm trying to help you but you won't listen. Um, the last Nicky scene. The last Nicky scene continues. where they're in a black box theater. With and he ends up killing him basically. Nick kills Nicky. That was the, the end of it. Yeah. Which is also interestingly, I think a studio concern that people when we showed the movie a lot, you know, people loved and hated Nicky. So then, because we we were. We had thought like, well, narratively, we think Nick needs to confront Nicky and get rid of him and get him out of his head, and we were hung up on that logic, and and then it, I think it was hard for audiences then to see Nick kill this version of himself. So it was, I mean, I, I still yeah. What you find in this process is uh, we maybe potentially just me. Like I, I have a very high tolerance for people who are terrible. Uh, and Kevin has a much lower bar, uh, for, you know, or a much higher bar, sorry. And, and um, you know, uh, for example, when Nick is singing the song at his daughter's birthday party, and it's like just deeply uncomfortable, uh, you know, when he takes over and he's kind of drunk, and he's like, come to the piano and watch me play. Um, we have like a four minute long version of that scene <laughs> that gets truly nuts. And I think. Yeah, Nick, at, at one point, Nick. You know, he goes, you know, real talent goes unrecognized in this shithole town. And then on set, he did a whole thing where he went, he started going, shit, shit, shit. And he got all the kids to, to start chanting, shit, shit, shit. So we had a version of that scene where they're all chanting shit for a minute. And it just is like He's so like gratefully playing and hammering on the piano. It's weird. And it's like, it's like how, it was too much for people to do. How kind of Ricky Gervais office cringe can you go? I mean, I kind of want it on a special feature <laughs> menu when we get a DVD and Blu ray now. Yeah, no, I don't know why we're telling you about all these things that are in the movie. I hope you like the ones that we left it's in there. It's a great title. Uh, I don't, yeah, I guess we're. Excited. <laughs> here, I All might right. dig myself a hole with this question here because you don't use IMDb trivia as a source, but I read that Dan Stevens originally had Pedro Pascal's role, and I can't view that role any other way than how Pedro plays him. So if that was true, how much did the character change when Pedro stepped in? Uh, no, Dan Stevens did not have that role. Um, That's what you get. <laughs> we, I guess in truth, we were... Uh, negotiating with Benicio Del Toro. Um, and it's a very different, obviously different version of that character, but we thought, ah, oh, two Oscar winners. That would make my life a living hell, I'm sure. Uh, but maybe. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Who's to say? Who's to say? But that is a, obviously a very different conception, and it, it sort of tips the hand that the guy is evil. It wouldn't play as much of a surprise. and. <clears throat> and when Pedro, we hired him to, to do the, the, the movie, we really knew him from like Game of Thrones. He's the Viper, and then he's in Narcos, and he plays these more macho, kind of masculine characters. And um, Pedro himself is, is a lot more like Javi. We went to meet him for a lunch, and he showed up, and he was like, all right, here's the thing. I, I don't care if you give me the role. I do, but I don't. I just want I love Nicolas Cage, and I just want to talk about my favorite movies. And he was just going crazy. And we were like, this is the, the guy. This is the guy. This is... I think this is Javi, because this is a truly also weird lunch. And then, uh, and yeah, and he was just like this sweet, you know, he presents as this hard-ass character, but he's really this sweet, kind of lovable human. And he showed up and wanted to play the hard-ass character, and Kevin and I kind of said, listen, I think you got to play fanboy Pedro Pascal. And he reluctantly agreed and then got into it, and it became, the, it became exactly, I think, uh, a nice counterpoint to Nick, who's in the middle of a love story and doesn't realize it, you know, and is still playing his, like, Charles Bronson, like, ah, I'm gonna get away from me, Javi, I don't, you know, that kind of thing. It's just pitch perfect casting there, I can't get over it. More excellent casting, and a fact that I know to be true is that Nick was the one who insisted on casting uh, Tiffany Haddish in that role. Did he ever explain <clears throat> what it was about her work that inspired him to make that suggestion? Because if I'm correct, I don't think they've ever worked together. No, I, he, um, he uh, basically, I, I think, like, most people in this movie are kind of a, doing a thing that you don't think that they're going to do. Um, Pedro's a very different version of Pedro. I think a lot of people had forgotten that Nick can do 
all different kinds of things, but particularly comedy, which he hasn't done in a long time. And I think Tiffany in kind of a more serious role would be able to bring some sort of comic edge to it, and we just thought it was kind of interesting. And I, don't, I, guess, I guess he was a fan. I mean, and as somebody mentioned, you know, she had been in Card Counter and Paul Schrader had, I think, reached out to Nick and yep. said how great she was. And so. And it was Nick's favorite thing about the Card Counter uh, was Tiffany. Excellent ways to connect the dots. Just because, like, I go by horror movie rules, where if you don't see, like, dead bodies and, like, sit there and focus on them, they might not be dead. Yeah. Right. Is <coughs> Tiffany's character and Ike's character, like, dead dead? They are dead dead. I just had a check. <laughs> I just had a check. You know, I mean, we went back and forth on whether they, whether they should be, honestly, even while we were shooting, and it was a question. And, but I think, ultimately, story-wise, we thought we wanted kind of a big stakes raise, and we wanted Nick to feel like, okay, I'm on my own, there's nobody to turn to here. Because, yeah, I mean, we obviously, we, we talked about the version of, in, you know, the, kind of the classic version would be that, she, you know, she isn't fed, and she shows up and helps the gang do the thing in the third act. But I think, you know, story-wise, we thought it would be it would be great for Nick to feel like he's, he's out there alone with no one to turn to. Makes sense. Yeah. Deep, deep down, I was rooting for them, though. <laughs> Another, but the uh, movie you're asking about a sequel, I suppose. Oh, yeah. No, I'm always wanting a sequel. That's what you're getting at. God, I hope so. I have a, a <laughs> spy question for you. Is, like, the slap paper a real thing? Like, where if you touch it on your skin, it'll drop like that? Oh, we read something about, like, a <laughs> chemical that absorbs into your uh, bloodstream. I don't know that it does it that quickly. <laughs> But there are a few other things that also aren't real in the film. Never would have guessed. Just go, you know, roll. Yeah, the answer is yes, it's totally real. All right, big broad question here, because I love hearing about bumps in the road and how we overcome them. So is there any day where everything seemed to be going wrong on set and you came up with a creative pivot and a scene in the film is better off for it? Yeah, there's, well, there's a couple. I think the best one was when the statue, the life, the, 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 wax, wax, sculpture. the wax sculpture showed up uh, on set, and it, it did not look anything like we thought it would. It, it had <laughs> melted in transit, so, so Nick, because this is the whole thing that happened, Nick is on the way to set. We open, you know, this thing, we, we unveil it, you know, out of its, like, container or whatever, and he's coming in, and... The face is like, it's melted. And it looks, I'm like, I can't show this to Nick. He's gonna, he's gonna walk off and say, it's truly horrifying. And so we went to Bill Corso, who was like the, um, uh, the, the prosthetics artist, head of our makeup department, who's like kind of a legend in the industry. He's one of the best in the world. And I said, Bill, you have to help me. You have to fix Nick's face, this is crazy. And so he was like, give me 20 minutes. He went in and, and he did what he could. And, what you saw is kind of like as good as we could get it, you know? <laughs> and, I mean, but, you know, it, it, so then it, we wheel it out, Nick sees it, well, I see it, Tom sees it, Pedro sees it, we're like, okay, this is... I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is <laughs> not quite right, but, I mean, it only made the scene funnier because it was just like, is, you know, Nick's line, how is this supposed to be, to be me, it's grotesque. <laughs> I'll give you 20000 for it. Yes, it's all we poured out of like much. how shitty that prop was, basically. Did you guys keep anything from that room? <sighs> from that room? We don't know where that statue is. Yeah, this is the great mystery. <laughs> we like to think that Pedro has it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's true. It would be also funny if Nick has it. Because he, he had said to us at one point, he said, I thought about collecting my own memorabilia for my kids, but then I think his kids didn't want it. <laughs> Something along those lines. And so I, I don't know whether he kept it or not. But, I mean, it would make sense. I think. Sadly, the one prize, it's not even a prop, it's something that's been used promotionally, but... At home, my five-year-old son sadly sleeps on like one of the Nick Cage pillow that you can swipe, which is. By the way, it's what am I son, doing? Who, for four years of his life, he thinks because all we talk about is Nick Cage, I think he thinks that he's his uncle. The <laughs> kid has he doesn't know a life without a Cage. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No, I mean maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but he does sleep with that pillow. <laughs> 
All right, I promised you guys I would open it up to audience questions. I'll squeeze in one more. Sorry, is this a terrible <laughs> well, I don't know what we're I'm talking about. I'm delighted right now. <laughs> Sorry. I have to highlight Sharon's performance yes. because they, she she really is an extreme scene I, stealer in this yeah, movie. I and like, I know you got a great script here, but is there a good example of a particular moment where she took what was on the page, what you gave to her, and just brought it to a level that you never could have expected? Yes, yeah. I think in the piano scene, for example, yeah. just her reactions, those aren't on the page. Like, and she's sort of a reaction machine. And yeah. when, when we got, we, we fought and fought and fought and fought and fought for her to get this role because we wanted her from the beginning. She makes you like Nick more, I think, and really grounds him uh, to think that the two of them had been married at some point. And, uh, you know, we were huge fans of Catastrophe. I don't know if you guys have seen that show. But so when we got her, we were like, hey, do you have any notes or thoughts for us? Do you want to like dates? And we were just, I don't know, fanboying out over. Yeah, no, that was the biggest. I mean, for me, that I was such a big Catastrophe fan. Like, it was, I thought it was just a perfect show. So, like, we got to, literally, they were like, who do you guys want? We were just like, Sharon Horgan is the only, and then she was into it, and we got on a call, and it happened, and yeah, it was like, Sharon, whatever, you, yeah. you can say whatever you want. Like, please help us. Also in the scene where um, uh, they bring the family down, I think she really kind of shines in that scene yeah. where she's like, are you dying? No, you know, creatively. She goes, oh, come on. <laughs> like, it's just, it's like perfect share. Yeah. So good at leaning into the comedy, yeah. but also never letting you forget that her family's lives are on yeah, the line. No, and that's a that's tough balance to hit there. Yeah, and as we played with genre, we always asked them to keep the performances as real as possible. And that's always tricky because Nick is an expressionist person and human being. He likes giant, larger than life characters. I'm particularly interested in um, naturalism, like in really authentic, stripped down characters. So we were constantly battling over. Uh, well, I tell this story, but we, I would say, uh, Nick, this is this is weird for both of us. But I think about you more than you think about you, and I know the best cage. <laughs> You'd be like, you don't know the best cage. And I was like, no, I do know the best cage. Best cage is neurotic cage, and he would neurotically defend himself and go, but I'm not even, I'm not neurotic. I'm, I'm a zen. I'm a very zen guy. And, and <laughs> this is, and so we get, we both start laughing, and then you would say, all right, fine, I'll just do it, and uh, you know. <laughs> All right, let's go right up here first. Love the movie. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Where's your film? Where did you get this uh, castle from a villa or, or the location? This amazing location. How did you get it? Uh, most of the exteriors are, not well, most of the exteriors, the exterior you're talking about is in Dubrovnik. Um, it's actually a house where a lot of the Game of Thrones cast lived. And oddly, the, the, the oval where uh, Pedro fought the mountain, where the viper fights the mountain, was about a five minute walk away. So we got to walk down there. It was a bit of an emotional thing for Pedro because he's like, this is where my career started and now I have this like first kind of starring role in a movie and that was pretty cool. But that's, a, that's, that's right outside of Dubrovnik. All right, let's go up there. I think your shirt's kind of like a greenish color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe your shirt's not green, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have said this, but at one point, a, a good friend of mine called me after having just seen Paddington 2, and he said to me, I just saw Paddington 2, I cried through the entire thing, it made me want to be a better man. So, I remembered that, and then when I watched it's Paddington 2, I, I, I cried, and well, it made me want to be a better man. And, <laughs> yeah, we, we said, I, like, I think this movie is a celebration of Nick's career, right, and, and the roles that he's played and all that, but we also wanted it to be, for us, like a celebration of just making things and movies in general that we love. And, like, you know, the, the two of them have essentially kind of a childlike relationship to one another. They're like having a fucking sleepover, like, at, you know, it's like you hired your best friend or something like that. But, you know, for, for us, that, you know, the two of them watching, uh, you know, a patting the kids movie essentially also was very funny to us. And I do feel like Paddington 2 is starting to get referenced in television shows, and I'm like, I, I feel like we had it on the page first. <laughs> we may have so not filmed it first, up. but we had it on the page yeah, very please. early. So I want credit. We yeah, want please credit give us credit. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everyone. Yeah. Yeah. first. 
just because I love spreading the love for movies that we love, what are your personal Paddington 2s? Something that you think is like underseen or doesn't get the credit it deserves because of the type of movie it is, but it makes your day when you can recommend it to someone and they fall in love with it. Oh. Anaconda? That makes sense. Oh, um, underseen. You gotta write back to me for that, sorry. Okay. What do we got, Koi? <laughs> I, I love that we're living in this like meta modernistic age of self reflection, and we've got the multiversal self reflection, meme culture, reaction videos, Deadpool, all of these things. Wow. What brought you into meta modernism, and what do you think societally we see in it in something like this? Oh, that's a. That's a big question. Yeah, that's a big question. Go for it, Tom. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I'll say. I'll say. Nick yelled one day on set because he thought something was amiss, and he, he yelled, and he, and he goes, he's like, wait a second, and he, and he yelled at me, and, and Kevin is standing next to me, and he's like, are you going to give me a chance to respond to it? And it was like a heated moment, and Kevin looks at me, and he goes, well, go on your directing fee. <laughs> he walks away. <laughs> But you know what, I, I will say that I think part of what drew Nick to the project was the challenge of getting to kind of play with his identity and, and draw, you know, from real parts of his life, but then also partake in this character we had created, and so he gets to do this kind of giant performance art piece. And I think what it speaks to is that we're all kind of doing that on social media where we're all creating characters that we play and you know we're showing parts of our life that we want to show and we're not showing parts of our life we don't want to show and we're creating we're all creating characters online and so this was like a chance for Nick to do it the, the, our pitch was Nick you can this is like having a giant Instagram movie for two hours about who you are and what you want to show to people yeah, we told him it was a big piece of performance art, <clears throat> and he was like, okay, now I'm listening, you know, like he gets into that, and, and, but I think in terms of like a meta-narrative as well, we were just drawn to the idea of, that there's been this concept, and, and we've, we've talked about this uh, at length with each other, about inside baseball, and you can't talk about making movies or writing movies, and there's been this thing, but now... That's a studio perspective, to, to be clear. Even still, where and it's still you'll pitch movies about movies, and they'll go, "What? No, nobody knows about that in America." And we're yeah. like, what? You can't do inside. The only thing you can make an inside baseball movie about is baseball, or like Moneyball. You can do that, but like, uh, it, yeah, great movie. And for us, you know, creating that um, that that meta narrative and talking about the, the making movies was sort of just part of the celebration. And everybody knows, you, you know, you. you that you can see behind the scenes of every single movie or television show being made on social media. People post them. So I think the average person who doesn't work in this industry has like a much greater understanding of how it works. And so we're able to comment on that in the course of uh, you know, a, you know, a constructed narrative. And then a large part of it was just finding the levels. Uh, I, I guess a good way to say it is the level at which we became annoying. And, um, you know, so, or you could feel the writer's hand is uh, how I would put it when you go, I can, because when I watch television shows at home, I can feel writers writing jokes and high-fiving each other. That's when I want to kick the television, <laughs> having been a television writer for a long time, and we, you can really feel the, the, the writerliness. So it was trying to find the, the balance of the meta-ness. How much you can comment to it. on it? I have a question for you, Tom, about working with Nick as an actor's director, specifically in terms of how, like, the way that Lily described it to me recently is that he's got, like, a one-of-a-kind way of working, like, his own method that is very specific to him. So is there anything one-of-a-kind Nick Cage that kind of rubbed off on you that you think you're going to take to your work as an actor's director on your next film? Hmm, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um... I'm not sure, but I'll, 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 I'll say this, like, and I said this to Nick uh, actually last night, and it's been something I've been thinking about quite a bit. He's worked with so many people that I admire um, and, and that I'm in awe of, and it's sort of intimidating when you get out there, and it's only, well, it's my second movie, it's our first movie together, and you get on set with Nick, and, and, and you know, and, you know, it can be very intimidating, but Nick makes a choice, he doesn't tell you this, but when he comes onto a film, 
he never makes her, you feel like you're any less of a director uh, than any of those people. And he decides to give you the same amount of respect. You never get the, I wouldn't do it that way, or no, this person would. Cohen brothers would have done it differently. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's thinking that at times. But he, he never says it. And I think there's like there's a certain amount of buy-in and respect that you give to actors when you hire them and that they give to you. And if you can find that reciprocity, I think the whole process becomes a lot more interesting. And like the, the, the sort of workflow of creative ideas is a little bit smoother. And I would like to take that, I think. I mean, and also just Nick was so great about just going, guys, let me do it how I want to do it three times. And then That's true. after that, come on in. And But just, here, I got an idea. I'm going to do my thing. Give me three chances at it. And then we'll, we'll, we'll fuck around and, you know, figure something out. Yeah, and he would say, um, and then I know that my job is to give you whatever you think you need as a director. And that was, that was a nice... Uh, nice approach, and I think I would use that with other actors going forward and say, do whatever you think is right. Uh, he wouldn't want to talk about it beforehand. He would say, I, I, it's going to be a surprise, and it often. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted, just wanted to do it. Yeah. Only actor I've ever worked with is like, can we start right inside on my coverage? <laughs> like, yeah, like Pedro, Pedro Pascal would still be like waking up, and Nick would be like, let's go right here. <laughs> Fight on me! And they'd be like, can we rehearse? And Nick would be like, no! <laughs> Fuck rehearsal! Let's shoot! Let's go! Jacked up on Red Bull and elliptical like, energy or whatever. And it would be great. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what the blocking <laughs> would be. Like, can we shoot a master? But he didn't, you know, he's like, he got some good stuff he needed to show us. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can squeeze in a few more right here on front. Uh, uh, so, can I talk about the. Uh, Creation about the, the that room, Harvey's room. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are so many details that in the background we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, what is your favorite Nick Cage movie and performance? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> well, that's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, it, 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 sorry. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. Yeah, he asked about um, the Nick Cage, the the Harvey's memorabilia room. Uh, what were some of the other artifacts that were in there? And uh, and then uh, what my favorite Nick Cage movie was, and you know it, it, we have the the axe from Mandy lying down in the front there, which maybe you caught. Also the chainsaw from Mandy. We have the VX nerve gas from The Rock, uh, which is Kevin's favorite Nicolas Cage movie. Mm -hmm. uh, the wooden hand from Moonstruck, maybe you caught that. The bunny from Con Air, and then. Uh, Three bizarre Nicolas Cage paintings that I think my assistant may have done, uh, and then like a ton of other uh, Some scripts. Too. There was a bunch of scripts that were there, and I, the, the Nicolas Cage pillow, which was a surprise to him. Part of the thing in that room was we wanted to bring Nick in, and he hadn't seen it yet. It was just sort of a genuine reaction where he's like trippy, like he was actually <laughs> really. Pretty weirded yeah, out that by was, that was, that was, was he rewrote that. I mean, that was him just going. I think I want to say trippy because that's that's how I'm feeling. Yeah, and he also he he um it wasn't scripted that he goes put the bunny back in the box or that he does any of that stuff and Pedro's reaction. So all their reactions are kind of genuine in that scene. But uh, and then my I'll give you the top three Nick Cage movies: Raising Arizona, Face Off. And my all-time favorite is Adaptation, which I think is a influence on this. And I, I gotta throw Moonstruck in there too. It's, I know that's not a strictly Nick movie, but it's one of my favorite. A little newer, but I know we have a lot of pig fans out in this oh, yeah. too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, so that's that's a fantastic performance. All right, let's get right up here. Um, what was the budget you guys would say? And secondly, uh, were there any like stories or favors you guys could pull or? I can do the repetition honors. Being asked about the budget and if there are any favors that needed to be pulled to get something in this movie. Can't tell you the budget. <laughs> uh, it's more than 10. Uh, but um, I, I think the whole the favors in terms of getting them. I mean, asking anybody to make the film with us on the crew uh, at the 
time we were making it felt like a favor. Um, getting getting them to just come in and want to work during that time where we didn't we still didn't know what was going to happen and you know try to be as safe as possible. So it, it was a lot of that convincing people to fly over. And then because it was that era where travel was restricted, uh, a lot of the favors were calling actors because you imagine things you don't think about um, during that time. You want someone to come and act for one day. Uh, a lot of the actors were in London at the time. And so they had to quarantine for 10 days in London plus seven days in Budapest for one day of work. So you'd basically say, can I have three weeks of your time? And it was insanely difficult to actually get anyone to play these roles. And, and the, the one major one we needed, and thank God, uh, Neil Patrick Harris, who plays his agent, had just had COVID. And he was like, ah, fuck it, I'll come to Budapest, no problem. <laughs> and so, he just came over and was able to do it and spent a couple of weeks hanging out with the cast. All right, last one. Pressure's on. It's got to be a good one. Who wants it? Anybody? We'll see. All right, right in the middle there. What was your uh, favorite scene or the scene you had the most fun shooting? Okay. Uh, okay, okay. I, I personally love the shoe exchange scene. <laughs> <laughs> It's just kind of deeply weird. <laughs> we were shooting it, and I was just like, let's just lock off the camera on a two shot and see what these children do. You know, they were just kind of, and uh, it, it, there were just like so many gems, and we were, and they were, they were really buying into the whole idea of like the love story of it all. With you know, it's just easy saying it at the same, you know, that kind of stuff. And so that that scene for me, sort of, um, that ends. Uh, part of the same sequence, but the, the shot that is sort of the, the idea of the whole movie, which is Nicolas Cage standing in front of the wax sculpture of him and face off, that comes around and the two uh, faces line up. But I'm a, a big fan of kind of imprecise movie making, and part of the joke is they don't, he's not really becoming, they don't line up exactly. <laughs> it's kind of like, they're just a little off. He's still an actor trying to become a, a character, so. I'll say one scene that, another scene that didn't end up in the film, but it'll be on the Blu-ray, but I, I love it, and it was, and it was really fun to shoot, is there's a scene where when Nick <clears throat> meets Pedro, and it's I and Javi, um, and then the, there's a scene where they cut to the two of them, and Javi's showing him around uh, his house, and Nick asks what the um, Wi-Fi password is, and Javi kind of takes a beat, he's a little embarrassed, we don't know why, and then he starts to spell it out, and he says, N-A-T-I-O-N-A-L. And it's National Treasure 2. <laughs> Holy Book of Secrets, all caps. <laughs> and he's like, you know, he's so ashamed. He's like, I'm sorry, I can change it, because I know it's weird. And then Nick um, gets offended, and he's like, yeah. why would you change it? He's yeah. like, I don't know why I would change it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great film and a phenomenal password. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a whole it's like spinning out. That was a fun one, and then the last one for me, sorry, is I think the last scene of the film where Nick is with his daughter, and uh, you see him kind of tear up, and it was a really emotional moment, and I, you know, I I, I got emotional, I saw old grizzled crew guys getting emotional, you know, everybody was like, it was a, it was a testament to Nick's ability to kind of click into whatever he was clicking into, and draw on that right when the camera was on. I was so amazed by it. You earned that emotional payoff. I went into this movie expecting like a <laughs> bonkers movie with one of my favorite actors playing himself, a silly like buddy comedy yeah. action movie. And I got something that has some, I got <laughs> that, but I got something that has some serious heart and something important Good. to say about art and creating and sharing storytelling. Well, thank you for saying that. And that was uh, one of the things that was most important to us was there, there's versions of this movie that are just basically a sketch um, or just fall into this like satirical kind of idea that you don't care about. And, we thought when we were writing the script that if we could make you emotionally attached to Nicolas Cage and his journey through his relationship with his ex-wife and daughter, that maybe this is a, a film that should be made. And I think that was ultimately the thing that, that got Nick was it was taking him and his life seriously, even though it's a fictionalized version of it. And so, you know, that, that thing, trying to get to that emotional payoff was like a huge uh, thing for us and maybe the Paddington 2 influence came through <laughs> where that movie has the ability to be at once kind of emotional but also very funny.
guys now that congratulations to you and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming thank out. Thank you guys. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. I don't think it works the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. <laughs>